The subject of this tutorial is on what factors do Ophir sensor accuracy specs depend. Uh, we state in our catalog that the calibration accuracy is plus or minus 3%. Now what does this mean? This specification means that the sensor will read within plus or minus 3% of the correct value at each power. Thus, if the sensor is calibrated with a centered beam at 532 nanometer at 1 watt, the sensor will read within plus or minus 0.03 watts of the correct value. If it's 10 watts, it'll read within plus or minus 0.3 watts. Let's look at this graphically. If we're reading a high power, then we see a larger error, which is still plus or minus 3% of the reading. If we're reading a lower power, we still have plus or minus 3% error in the reading, but it is a smaller value. When we state a calibration accuracy of plus or minus 3%, we are referring to what is statistically called two sigma calibration. This means that the errors are statistically random and therefore, in 95% of the cases, the sensor will read within plus or minus 3% of the correct value. And in 99% of the cases, it will read within plus or minus 4% of the correct value. We see this on the graph here. This is a two sigma variation with a bell-shaped statistical curve. The blue region shows the 95% of the cases are within the blue region here, and 5% are within the white areas at the side. We see that this graph rapidly drops to zero, and therefore the chance that we'll have an even larger area than that is very small. Everything I've said until now is for the conditions calibrated. In addition to this, if a measurement is a different power value than we calibrated it, there can be an additional error in reading due to nonlinearity. That can add as much as plus or minus 1% to the maximum error. That error is usually the most near the highest measurable power and when the sensor gets hot. This is shown in the first drawing to the left. We see here the black line refers to a, an ideal uh, meter that is perfectly linear. If I put in 10 times as much power input, I get 10 times as much output. The red line refers to a sensor that has non-linearity, in this case towards the maximum part of the scale. So we see that there's an additional error when it is non-linear. Now, in addition to that, we have another kind of error called zero offset. The zero offset becomes important when we're trying to read a very small value. What is zero offset? It means that even if we put no input into the meter, we get a reading even so. Now, that could be because of external heat sources or the fact that the meter was not zeroed properly. Now, let's say that there was a zero offset of 10 milliwatts, 0.01 watt. If we're reading a laser of 10 watts, then the meter will read 10.01 watts, an additional error of 0.1% very small. But if we're trying to measure 0.1 watt, then the reading will be 0.11 watt, an error of 10%. We can see this in the second diagram. Here we've magnified the low power region and we're looking at it here carefully and we see an offset. Now, this offset, if we're measuring a high power, the offset is negligible. But if we're measuring a very low power, the offset could become a very significant amount of the reading. This brings us to the next question, where we give a spec in Ophir called the minimum measurable power. What does that mean in our case? The diagram shown here is an exaggerated view of the noise and drift of a power meter. You would see this kind of graph if you're measuring very low powers. So if we're measuring the minimum amount of power, we take the noise and when it's important, the drift, and we say that the measurement is 20 times of that noise and drift. In other words, the at maximum error that you can expect at the lowest measurable power is 5%. Now, other manufacturers might define the minimum measurable power as the noise. In other words, where the signal to noise is one. 
which means you can measure something, but you certainly don't know what its value. So we take a very conservative view of what is the minimum measurable power. One of the other possible errors is uniformity over the sensor. When we calibrate the sensor, we center the beam and we have a beam size that is not large. It's usually no more than one third of the aperture. Now what happens if the user wants to measure with a very large beam or a beam that's off towards the side? That gives you an extra error. Now we define usually, as you can see in this graph, that the maximum error for a beam that is off-center is plus or minus 2% error within 50% of the area of the aperture, or 70% of the diameter. If you carefully center the beam on your power meter, then you can usually ignore this source of error. Now, there are other sources of error that are possible for pulsed lasers. When we want to measure the energy of a pulsed laser, there are two more things that have to be taken into account, the repetition rate and the pulse width. Now, we usually calibrate our meters at 10 hertz repetition rate and laser pulse widths that are rather small, about 10 nanoseconds. This is typical for commonly used YAG and harmonic lasers. Now, the dependence of the error with pulse width and repetition rate is usually very little until we get close to the maximum allowed. Let's look at the next graph here. We see that the error is pretty much constant and very small until we start getting towards the limit given for the pulse width and repetition rate. Now the error with pulse width, as long as we stay within the limits given in the specification, we can usually ignore. And the errors with frequency are given in the specification and they only become important for something like 70 or 80 percent of the maximum pulse rate. Now there's another source of error we have to take into account for all of our sensors and that is error due to the wavelength of measurement. Ophir sensors absorb different amounts at different wavelengths. If we look at this graph here we have two types of absorbers on our sensors. We have absorbers such as the green graph here that are flat with wavelength and change very little at different wavelengths. And we have absorbers that change a lot with different wavelengths such as this BF curve here with the red curve. Now with the flat type, the green type, we basically give the user several regions of measurement which we can see by the straight green lines here. Let's say he wants to measure somewhere in the visible region. He dials in less than 0.8 microns and he measures anywhere within that region and the error will be usually no more than plus or minus 1% or so. The same thing goes if he chooses the near infrared region. And sometimes we define a particular point for a particular laser outside of that region. That's the 2940 wavelength. Now with the red curve, the BF curve, we can't do this. We can't define regions because the absorption varies too rapidly. Therefore, we actually measure the absorption curve of each sensor. We make up a graph of sensitivity with wavelength and we put this into the uh, memory chip of the sensor. Then if the user, say, wants to measure 1,500 nanometers, he dials in 1,500 in his meter, and the sensor pulls out the absorption figure for that wavelength and gives an exact correction. So this sums up all the sources that we know of for error for our meters. Uh, Ophir tries to be very careful to define exactly all sources of error so the user can be confident when he uses our products.